Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction of all of us. And, uh, and I think your introduction sort of speaks on your behalf, you know, um, about your generosity as a scholar and, and as a person. Like other public crises, the opioid epidemic has yielded many stories and narratives. Dope sick, painkiller, dreamland, clean, hillbilly elegy, to name a few of the nonfiction bestsellers. There is also much noteworthy fiction and poetry. There are testimonials by those who have survived struggles with addiction and by those who didn't, and also by their families. There are memoirs by doctors who were themselves addicted or who regret their past prescribing habits. There are photographic essays featuring hard-hit neighborhoods such as Kensington in Philadelphia and coloring books to engage those suffering from addiction in therapy and learning. What I'd like to draw our attention to today is a narrative about addiction that I see as both democratic and epic. The narrative captures the lives of ordinary figures as they come into contact with the manufacture, trafficking, and consumption of drugs at a time in the history of our nation when addiction has reached crisis proportions. My two examples are David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest and Vince Gilligan's TV serial, Breaking Bad. They are exceptional both in their self-conscious traditionalism and in their creation of characters who are both typical and larger than life. The subject of addiction here becomes the avenue for probing the state of society and the general condition of the US citizenry. These works also display multicultural awareness. Their fictional worlds are presented as distinct parts of a diverse nation. A temptation of the literature on addiction, and such temptations predate Thomas de Quincey's 19th century classic, Confessions of an English Opium Eater, is a reliance on neat polarities. A life dominated by drugs is either romantic and liberating or deviant and pathological. Memoir writers rely on winner-loser paradigms, whether featuring a survivor who triumphs over drug dependency or a Job-like sufferer who loses the battle. Given the magnitude of our crisis, it makes sense to seek narrative comfort in what is familiar and clarifying. But deeper understanding lies elsewhere. Infinite Jest and Breaking Bad reveal how democratic the state of addiction is, touching every class, culture, and gender, while also revealing its human variety. They demonstrate, as Jacques Derrida has noted about major literary accounts of addiction, that, quote, there is not any single world of drugs. Artaud's text is not Michaud's or Benjamin's, neither of which should be confused with Baudelaire's text, which in turn is not that of De Quincey or Coleridge. To conflate such differences in a homogeneous series would be delirious, indeed narcotizing. But then, can one ever condemn or prohibit without also somehow confusing?" Unquote. Derrida is being ironic in implying that the standardization required by policy is another form of narcotic delusion. But he is talking here about addiction in the context of the AIDS epidemic, and he readily concedes that however threatening to individuality, policy saves lives. People can only be understood in the richly diverse terms that they deserve if they are around to tell their stories. Still, Derrida's observation that policy by necessity is limited in ways that cultural works are not is one that even most non-humanists would accept. So for the next 20 minutes, I'll try to show what a classic US novel and TV serial have to offer our contemporary debates on opioids. My hope is that analyzing how these works treat the subject of addiction will deepen our understanding of our contemporary crisis. 
David Foster Wallace was a leading writer of the contemporary U.S. canon. According to L.A. Times book editor David Ulin, Wallace, quote, brought ambition, a sense of play, a joy in storytelling, and an exuberant experimentalism of form back to the novel, and restored the notion of the novel as a kind of canvas on which a writer can do anything, unquote. New York Times columnist Frank Bruni wrote that, quote, Wallace is to literature what Robin Williams or perhaps Jim Carrey is to live comedy, a creator so maniacally energetic and amused with himself that he often follows his riffs out into the stratosphere where he orbits all alone. Wallace struggled from his teen years with alcoholism as well as drug addiction and went through a legendary rehabilitation in Boston area facilities, so recently that some clinicians and even former residents still remember him. Thus, addiction as portrayed in his greatest novel, Infinite Jest, is an inside narrative inspired by experience, but structured as an exploration of the psychology, social norms, and political and economic circumstances underlying the growing national addiction problem. Like Herman Melville, who in Moby Dick presents the New England whaling industry as key to 19th century American culture, Wallace in Infinite Jest presents addiction and the system that enables it as key to US culture in the 1990s, which we can recognize in 2018 as prophetic. Set in many of the local neighborhoods, Alston, Brighton, Cambridge, abutting Boston University, the novel represents addiction through both individual characters and the institutions that seek their re rehabilitation. Wallace captures particularities as well as trends, detailing the rituals that define social relations in different contexts, from the banks of the Charles River where homeless persons who use opioids live, to the private boarding schools where high achieving young drug users work and play, to the rehabilitation centers where almost everyone ends up. For Wallace, speech expresses who we are and have the potential to be. So the novel is a chorus of monologues, dialogues, and lingos sometimes vital, sometimes deadening, favored by street people and students, patients, doctors, friends, and family. In short, all those whose lives are affected by narcotics, which is to say, everyone. It is important to recognize how Wallace's personal success informs his understanding of addiction. An accomplished teenage tennis player a top student at elite schools graduating summa cum laude from Amherst. He later attended graduate school in philosophy at Harvard. His Amherst senior thesis in English became his first novel, The Broom of the System. And in his 30s, he achieved star status, anointed by the literary establishment as the best novelist of his generation. All of this was done while he struggled with addiction to alcohol, marijuana, and opioids. Wallace's immersion in the pressures that accompany success drove his need for narcotizing. And he recognized this need as widely shared. As he shows in Infinite Jest, dubbed by Newsweek magazine his, quote, grating American novel, unquote, our competitive status conscious world catalyzes the widespread need to drink, snort, and shoot up. This self-medicating is a means of survival until for too many of us, it becomes the opposite. Combining empathy, originality, and sociological insight, Wallace probes our cultural wounds with unique expertise. Language makes each of his characters rare and memorable, whether they're descriptions by others or their own idiomatic speech. 
Consider, for instance, moms. Widow of a husband addicted to alcohol, mother of a son addicted to sex, who runs a tennis school full of anxious teenagers dealing and consuming drugs, and Lenz, the rehab resident who replaces his cocaine habit with another kind of high, stalking the streets at night, killing stray dogs and cats. Here is one of mom's three sons describing how she manages emotions. Quote, she went around with her feelings out in front of her with an arm around the feelings windpipe and a Glock 9 millimeter to the feelings temple, like a terrorist with a hostage daring you to shoot, unquote. In classic Wallace form, an excessive metaphor captures an overpowering human state. Mom's maternal affect is so threatening that her son experiences it as terrorism. The metaphor transforms the intimate relations between mother and son into a state of emergency. This description of Lenz uses synecdoche to reconcile the character's creepy idiosyncrasies with a deeper representativeness. Listening ears and flapping mouths become emblems of democratic inclusivity at the rehab house, where the general human preference for talking over listening prevails. Lenz enjoys a sympathetic and listening ear to have around. Talking is sort of Lenz's way of thinking. And, but most of the ears of the other residents at Ennett House are not only unsympathetic, but are attached to great gaping, flapping oral mouths which keep horning into the conversation with the mouths' own opinions and issues and aspects. Most of the residents are the worst listeners Lenz has ever seen. The next few slides from Infinite Jest further stage Wallace's skill in rendering the speech of the heterogeneous humanity that exists at the center of an addiction crisis. The doctor, the doctor hadn't even pretended to try to take notes on all this. He couldn't keep himself from trying to determine whether the ambient blank insincerity the patient seemed to project during what appeared clinically to be a significant gamble and move toward trust and self-revealing was in fact projected by the patient or was somehow counter-transferred -trans or projected onto the patient from the doctor's own psyche out of some sort of anxiety over the critical therapeutic possibilities her revelation of concern over drug use might represent. The rehab counselor, that nobody who's ever gotten sufficiently addictively enslaved by a substance to need to quit the substance and has successfully quit it for a while and been straight and but then has, for whatever reason, gone back and picked up the substance again, has ever reported being glad that they did it, used the substance again and gotten re-enslaved. That other people can often see things about you that you yourself cannot see even if those people are stupid. That everybody is identical in their secret, unspoken belief that way deep down, they are different from everyone else. And finally, the patient. Ah, there we go. If you sit up front and listen hard, all the speaker's stories of decline and fall and surrender are basically alike and like your own. Fun with the substance, then very gradually less fun, then significantly less fun because of like blackouts you suddenly come out of on the highway going 145 kph with companions you do not know, nights you awake from in unfamiliar bedding next to somebody who doesn't even resemble any known sort of mammal. <laughs> Therapeutic self-consciousness, as many in this audience know, can be a paralyzing form of expertise. But Wallace leaves room for hope. The doctor's uncertainty about where his own subjectivity ends and that of the patient begins is potentially humanizing, leading perhaps to greater empathy between doctor and patient. 
The passages from the perspective of counselor and patient further reveal the ongoing lessons in democracy provided by the cycle of addiction. The perpetual tension in infinite jest is between being special versus accepting one's place in the horde, between distinction and extinction. Wallace presents this essentially democratic conundrum, the desperate ongoing effort to be a one among the many as central to addiction. Perhaps no medium has done a better job than television in exploiting this conundrum. Wallace adored TV and considered TV watching dangerously addictive. He argued in a 1993 essay that the problem was that analysts didn't take it seriously enough. This is another way in which Wallace was prophetic because TV has become increasingly pivotal in explaining our culture to itself. And many of the great serials, The Wire, The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, are centrally concerned with drugs and addiction. Breaking Bad has attracted one of the largest audiences in television history, in part because of its skill in updating so many cultural mythologies and literary archetypes, among them the quest narrative. The serial portrays a hero, Walter White, confronting a life-ending cancer diagnosis, who becomes a producer of methamphetamine, setting out into a terrifyingly violent world of drug traffickers to achieve financial security for his family before he dies. In so doing, he discovers a new self. Running around in briefs and a gas mask in Breaking Bad's first episode, Walter White is a Walter Mitty who understands chemistry but is clueless about how to make his way in the world. Underinsured, like many American men of modest means, Walt's surname and that of his addicted sidekick, Jesse Pinkman, suggests that he is part of the suffering white underclass identified by Princeton economists Ann Case and, August, and Angus Deaton. Harshly impacted by a global economy and experiencing a marked decline in their life expectancy. Prior to the cancer diagnosis, Walt is already moonlighting at a car wash because his salary as a chemistry teacher is inadequate to the needs of his growing family. Such details reveal Walt as an embodiment of what Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb called the hidden injuries of class. A brilliant 1972 study of the psychological effects of the American class system that remains relevant today. What makes Breaking Bad such a powerful serial is the sustained critique of inequality in the US that underlies its crowd-pleasing drama and sensationalism. The engine of this critique is Walt's diagnosis of stage three terminal lung cancer, which the serial presents as a terrible misfortune and an economic catastrophe. As a secondary school teacher in a country that neither values its teachers nor considers itself obligated to provide them with sufficient medical insurance, Walt's illness casts him as both a victim of fate and a loser in the health lottery of American capitalism. Yet this double damnation, universal as well as political, precipitates Walt's journey to American style manhood. The more enmeshed he becomes in the criminal underworld of the New Mexico drug trade, the more empowered and self-realized he feels. Far more than simply something Walter White is good at, drug manufacturing and trafficking turns out to be, to be the means to his truest self. He was put on earth, it seems, to be strategic, heartless, and cruel. And this is what it takes to be a self-reliant man in 21st century America, according to Breaking Bad, a southern term for going wild. 
The serial reveals how an ordinary man becomes a monster, depicting Walt setting up his own methamphetamine factory in a trailer, then growing the small profitable business from street sales through trafficking to Mexican drug cartels, each level requiring more extreme callousness and violence. But Walt is not Purdue Pharma. His success is the result of Franklinian ingenuity. His product is top of the line, purer than the street has ever seen. And he is an American lone wolf who has turned to crime for good reasons. Like Don Corleone, he aims to preserve his personal dignity while ensuring economic security for his wife and children, one of whom is handicapped. The serial does not glorify crime, but complicates endlessly the lines between good and bad. In another parallel to The Godfather, Breaking Bad shows how readily criminality can be reconciled with dominant American values, whether ideals of self-reliance or the myth of the family. One of the most appealing characters is Walt's brother-in-law, Hank, who works for the Drug Enforcement Administration. While Hank is incorruptible, the DEA is depicted as equally likely to be in conspiring with drug dealers as it is to be policing them. Breaking Bad is as grimly realistic and non-judgmental in its approach to addiction, portrayed through Walt's former high school student, Jesse Pinkman, who can't resist the methamphetamine they produce. Expert chemists confirm that the cereal provides a strikingly accurate account of methamphetamine production. Its symbolism is equally adept. When Walt tells his class in the first episode that, quote, chemistry is, well, technically, it's the study of matter, but I prefer to see it as the study of change, unquote. He is describing the show's plot the transformation of the protagonist into the antagonist, as well as human existence, the journey from one chemical form to another. The theme of change is also central to Breaking Bad in another sense. The serial features a protagonist involuntarily subjected to change, a cancer diagnosis, who aggressively seizes control over his life. In a type of Freudian repetition compulsion, Walt embraces change on his own terms, rejecting the overwhelming forces of fate and social inequity that oppress him. Indeed, Breaking Bad suggests that the problem of addiction is inextricably linked to the collision between people's socioeconomic circumstances and their need for dignity, to feel ennobled and capable of some kind of transcendence. Like Walt, those who are addicted to drugs seek control over the highs and lows, the losses and gains that disarrange any life. But like Walt, who becomes a slave to his own ambition, losing the family he sought to protect in the process, those who are addicted are ultimately enslaved by the drugs that seem to empower and liberate them. Again, Breaking Bad combines existential commentary with political critique. Walt's experience foregrounds the tension between self-actualization and the need for others. What Walt can't control, above all, is the love and loyalty of his family, who abandon him once they discover the truth about his violent career. By the serial's end, Walt's family rejects him and his money. Deprived of their respect and love, he channels his drug fortune to them anonymously. This is a cruel irony for a man who believes that he is measured not by how he treats his family, but by his ability to support them financially. Walt ultimately recognizes that his criminal pursuits were never simply about kinship or money, but about the affirmation of his own power and identity. This is where the audience comes in. 
Walter White is a drug producer, drug dealer, killer, and liar. But we cheer him on because he is so much more alive as a vengeful criminal than as a dutiful victim. The serial thrusts this moral dilemma on us as viewers and in so doing illuminates the human condition. On the one hand, we are all just chemical compounds, victims, ushered from lifeless matter to life, then back to lifeless matter in death. What we manage to make of our, of our preposterously abbreviated time in the world is up to us. So where do these two literary and TV accounts of addiction leave us? The works I have discussed today help us to recognize how tenuous the border between our conventional and destructive relationships to narcotics can be. They also highlight the necessity of understanding every addictive experience in its raw particularity. The utopian silver lining in the cloud of our crisis might well be that it foregrounds the double meaning of democracy. Walt Whitman's poetry turns out to be pivotal to the plot of Breaking Bad. And it is not coincidental that he was also a profound theorist of democracy. As political philosopher George Kateb has noted, Whitman articulated as well as anyone how the intensification of democracy in America leads to the flowering of individuality. Um, I should just tell you that this, you can see that this is a, the character, um, Hank, Hank's brother-in-law, uh, excuse me, Walt's brother-in-law, Hank, reading, um, he's reading Leaves of Grass on the toilet. That's the sort of clever, ironic um, ending to, to the, the whole serial. I don't think I've ruined it for, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, just, just to mention that this happens at the end. Um, though seemingly contradictory, these are complementary, even inseparable ideals. This, the idea of the intensification of democracy in America um, on the one hand and the flowering of, democ uh, of individuality on the other. And here's a quote um, from Whitman's Democratic Vistas, quote, to democracy the leveler, the unyielding principle of the average is surely joined another principle equally unyielding, closely tracking the first, indispensable to it, opposite. This second principle is individuality, unquote. To recognize addiction as democratizing, afflicting families, friends, and colleagues, is not to preclude another meaning of democratic, the valuing of individuality. Democratizing our understanding of addiction by recognizing its pervasiveness allows us to save lives. But beyond this lies another democratic ideal, that every sufferer represents an individual unknown to us. If saving people requires acknowledgement of their common humanity, keeping them saved requires respecting the distinctiveness of every human life and story. Thank you.